Now it is my great pleasure, an unusual pleasure, to introduce Michael Jacobson, executive director and co-founder of the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Mike holds a PhD in microbiology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and since 1971 has helped make CSPI a key player in battles against obesity, cardiovascular disease, and other health problems, including education, legislation, litigation, and a healthy dose of creative showmanship. His vision and hard work have led to nutrition labeling of foods, the gradual elimination of dangerous trans fats from our foods, and putting a spotlight on the need to consume lower salt diets. Mike's 1998 pamphlet, Liquid Candy, was one of the first documents that highlighted soda's contribution to obesity and the need to push for policy changes. Mike claims not to have drunk a soft drink since about 1975, though he's been doing penance for all his other youthful indiscretions when he was in high school. And for those who, of you who are interested, we have a videotape of those, and we're selling them for $5 each at the front <laughs> desk. Mike has received numerous awards, but I know that he's very proud of the American Public Health Association's David P. Rawl Award for Advocacy in Public Health, as well as the Esther Peterson Consumer Service Award from the Food Marketing Institute. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the man from Chicago who conceived of this summit and calls soda pop, my friend Mike Jacobson. He's here. He'll, he'll remind us all why we're here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, George. Nothing like having a staff member write that glowing introduction <laughs> for you. Well, welcome, everybody, to the first National Soda Som Summit. It's great to see people here from all over the country, from diverse organizations. And we're part of really what's become a new movement to promote health by reducing the consumption of soft drinks and move people towards healthier beverages. And given all the publicity about the impact of soft drinks, this summit couldn't be timelier. Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg, for that. And until the past decade or so, health experts had largely given soft drinks a pass. Yeah, people knew that Soft drinks promoted tooth decay, but that's been kind of um, just written off as a minor problem. And everybody realized that they, soft drinks contain calories, but everything contains calories, so they weren't thought of anything special. There was little direct scientific evidence that soft drinks were particularly harmful. Um, I remember back in the 1970s, sugar was the big nutritional uh, bugaboo and so, uh, tooth decay was just about the only thing people talked about. There was little connection to, uh, to heart disease, obesity, and other health problems. But over the years, nutrition researchers slowly, and now more recently, more quickly, began exploring soda's impact on health. And while the researchers were doing that slowly, the soft drink industry was spending very liberally to maximize consumption. It spent millions to convince us that things go better with Coke, that Coke is the pause that refreshes, and it's Pepsi for those who think young. Currently, Coca-Cola Company, just that one company, spends at least $2 billion a year, $2 billion a year, promoting the sale of its sugary drinks. The number is just absolutely uh, um, mind-bending. And Pepsi probably spends almost as much. And both companies, Coke and Pepsi, announced earlier this year that they were going to throw hundreds of millions more dollars into getting us to drink more of their products. Added to those companies are Dr. Pepper, Kraft, and others that market both carbonated and non-carbonated beverages and spend a lot of money to get us to buy them. And normally when we think of marketing ploys, we think of advertising. It's the most obvious thing. But there are a lot of other approaches that companies use. 
They pay supermarkets huge amounts to discount soda and to put up these huge displays. We're going to see more about, hear more about that at, at, um, at lunchtime from our speaker, Todd Putman. The companies put their products everywhere. That's the best form of marketing, so that if you're thirsty, there's, there's a soda. The president of Coca-Cola once said, we're putting ice cold Coca-Cola and our other brands within reach, wherever you look, at the supermarket, the video store, the soccer field, the gas stations, everywhere. That was the president of Coca-Cola, and they've pretty much done it. The companies dole out grants to nonprofit, medical, and civic organizations. They give money to cities for promotional rights in the city. And their goal is to win allies from unexpected quarters, or at least to silence potential critics. They put their brand names everywhere children go. They, they like that uh, brand indoctrination at a very young age. Uh, from, they put their brand names in museums, uh, product placement on American Idol, and their drinks at theme parks everywhere. Uh, and another way they've promoted sales is, is with bigger serving sizes. When I was a little boy, six and a half ounces was the standard Coke. This is what I picked up at Giant Foods. This is a three liter bottle of soda. It's the largest one I've ever seen. 99 cents for this. It's quite a deal. Don't everybody run out and get it right now. But about 15 years ago, people began connecting the dots. Remember, researchers were doing that quiet research. And some of the um, most important research was to document the obesity epidemic. And it clearly began around 1980. Obesity rates in adults have more than doubled. Obesity rates in children have tripled. And rates of super obesity, BMIs of 40 or more, have quadrupled since around 1980. And it didn't go without notice that that explosion at our waistlines coincided with the salad days for Coke and Pepsi, as sugary drinks became America's, Americans' single largest source of calories. So scientists started delving into the health effects of sugary drinks. One of the most interesting things they discovered is that caloric beverages were more conducive to weight gain than solid foods. It's like the brain doesn't recognize that beverages have calories. Maybe because in the old days, you know, 10 million years ago, 100 million years ago, beverages didn't have calories. When animals got thirsty, they went to the river and they drank. Scientists also generated a growing body of research that provides today varying amounts of evidence that sugary drinks promote obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, weakened bones, kidney stones, and other illnesses. This is a plague, and it's a plague because we're consuming so much of it. By 2000, the evidence linking sugary drinks to health problems became substantial enough that the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, our nation's national nutrition policy, began encouraging people to consume less soda pop. Perhaps the first policy changes started back then, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, when parents and health advocates began getting school districts to kick out soda. Ultimately, Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper Snapple capitulated to a changing national mood and the threat of a lawsuit and took their sugar water out of almost all schools. At least their full strength sodas, they still have uh, um, sports drinks in, the, in the schools. For industry, the, the problem in schools was just the beginning of their headaches. But, of course, the soda industry didn't just roll over and play dead and say, oh, you know, we'll comply with the public's wishes. Industry has spent around $100 million in the last few years successfully fighting off and in Maine and Washington actually repealing soft drink taxes. They just hired lobbyists to fight off potential restrictions for soda purchases through the SNAP, the food stamp program. 
They've promoted legislation to ban CDC grants that attack, quote, legal products. And they're pressing state and local governments not to mount anti-soda campaigns. And we'll talk about some of these issues in, in the workshops. Notwithstanding industry's massive marketing and political effort, we've begun to see some welcome and historic changes in consumption. Between 1998 and 2011, production of sugary soda pop declined by a remarkable 24%. That's about 10 gallons per person per year. And we probably should give a special award to PepsiCo and its marketing department because per capita production of Pepsi-Cola has dropped by 46% since 1998. It's an incredible change. And Coca-Cola production per capita has dropped by 31%. And let's hope that Coke catches up with Pepsi. While we're drinking several gallons more of sports drinks each year, it in no way makes up for the decline in full strength soft drinks. What's been driving down soda sales? Well, you know, big things, Americans are just becoming more health conscious. And one reflection of that is that we're, we're drinking a lot more bottled water. We've doubled bottled water consumption since 1998, almost 13 gallons more per person per year. Another factor, I think, was the South Beach diet and the Atkins diet. They got millions of people to turn away from sugary drinks. Institutions have begun changing their policies. For instance, Boston and other cities have removed all or most sugary drinks from all their public property, from government office buildings to cafeterias to prisons to parks. The Cleveland Clinic, Montefiore Medical Center, and other hospitals have eliminated sugary drinks from patients' trays cafeterias, and vending machines. And they serve as great examples for every other employer in the country and what they could do to promote employee health. Thanks to the prevention fund created by the Affordable Care Act, which Republicans are gunning for, of course, the Centers for Disease Control has begun funding Los Angeles, Seattle, Philadelphia, and other local governments to mount anti-obesity campaigns and the prominent features are public service announcements that you'll see in subway cars and in New York and um, on, the, on the airwaves and YouTube. And we have some of those ads on the laptop computer out there. In the past few years, there's been huge and usually critical publicity surrounding everything from the movie Super Size Me um, and soda taxes to warning labels and the carcinogens in the caramel coloring in cola drinks. And efforts to use public policies to move people in a healthier direction are popping up in, in all different places um, and most prominently last week when New York City announced a proposed limit on portion sizes at restaurants. And that opens up a new front in the campaign against soda. That limit was, um, the proposed limit is 16 ounces per cup. The largest cup you can get is 16 ounces. Just by coincidence, on the eve of the, that announcement, CSPI commissioned a national poll to hear what the public thinks about limiting the, the portion sizes at restaurants. Uh, there had been no discussion about this at all. But 50% of the public supported a limit on uh, serving sizes, uh, and 48% uh, percent opposed that. Among, among blacks and Latinos, the percentage was 58% uh, in support of a limit on the size of soft drinks. And I think as this issue, uh, is discussed more and more in the public media and in meetings, this, it's going to gain traction and we're going to see the percentage of support increase gradually over the coming year or years. So that's 16 ounces. It's worth noting that in Denmark, Austria, and Germany, the largest soda that McDonald's sells is 17 ounces. So quite similar to what New York City is proposing. It seems that when 
industry does something, when industry acts as the national nanny, it's okay. But when government uh, wants to act, all of a sudden people get upset. And we'll be hearing more about portion sizes later this morning from New York City's health commissioner, Tom Farley. Everything I've mentioned represents a giant public relations nightmare for the industry and a real eye-opener for people who thought of soft drinks as well, you know, just, just a soft drink. People are gradually recognizing that Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola are really toxicolas and are causing tremendous health harm. Industry officials argue that the decline in consumption proves that soda doesn't cause obesity. They say that Americans are drinking less soda, but obesity rates are soaring. In fact, though, the Centers for Disease Control reports that rates of obesity and overweight are actually leveling off. And I'm sure that is due in good part to the declining sales of soft drinks. Because soda sales are going nowhere but down in the United States, Coke and Pepsi are placing new billion dollar bets on developing countries. Coca-Cola alone has pledged to invest about $21 billion in just four countries, Brazil, Mexico, India, and China, over the next five years. $21 billion. You know, these countries, per capita consumption is probably, um, on average, three cans of, of Coke a year. You know, nothing. They'd love to get that up to the hundreds of servings a year that uh, is, is in the United States. And uh, we shall see what happens. But um, it's something that health ministries around the world should be paying attention to. And I think that Dr. Barry Popkin may be saying something more about this later. Um, I'd like to uh, end my flogging of the soft drink industry and bring up a few other things that we shouldn't forget about in our fervor to attack soda. First, reducing or ending, totally ending soda consumption is not by itself going to return obesity to its pre-1980 levels. There are a lot of factors that have caused the obesity epidemic, and we're going to have to work on a lot of factors to reverse it and get back down to a slender America. Second, excess soda and excess sugar are not the only problems in the American diet. We've got to cut down on calories and sodium and saturated fat and white flour, and we need to eat a lot more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Finally, believe it or not, I'd like to throw a flower, if not a bouquet, to the soda industry. For, to my knowledge, it has never advertised on Saturday morning television, and that's something we should all be grateful for. That said, take away the flower, our challenge for today and tomorrow is to learn, brainstorm, network, and plan on how to bend the curve of sugary drink consumption down farther and down faster. Some of the sessions are going to address issues that I think most of us agree on, such as how to counter industry's marketing and lobbying efforts, how to encourage people to consume healthier beverages. Other sessions will discuss more controversial issues, such as whether governments should slap excise taxes on soda, and how to improve healthy beverage choices in low-income communities. We're hoping that some of those discussions will lead towards some consensuses. Now, let me end with a few thank yous. First, a supersized thank you to the Kresge Foundation, which has provided generous financial support that allowed us to sponsor this conference. Thanks also to the American Heart Association, the California Endowment, and the California Center for Public Health Advocacy, which are co-sponsoring this conference and providing financial or in-kind contributions. I'd like to thank all our speakers, panelists, and attendees for taking the time to participate in this. And I hope it's going to be interesting and a lot of fun. And last but not least, I, th I think that Ju CSPI's Julie Greenstein and George Hacker, along with their assistants, Cassie Bowles, Ashley Rowe, and Alana Lehrer, deserve a real round of applause for all of their work over the months. <laughs>